Well, I guess we can go home now. We've had church. We hear a lot about colors, red states, blue states, purple states, white, green, black, orange. We hear a lot about colors, but there's one color that is a very, very dangerous color. I don't think you could guess what it is. It is an angry color, it is a dangerous color, it is a color that breeds discord, and the color is gray. Gray is pigment without any colors. All the colors are absent. It's just sort of a bland gray. And gray is a very, very dangerous color. Somebody might say, I thought we'd talk about parenting. What does that have to do with parenting? I can tell you what it has to do with parenting. It has everything to do with parenting. You have a gray father who is passive. You can predict with almost unerring accuracy the plight of the sons and the daughters, a gray dad. You can find a mom who is gray and just going through the motions. It's such a labor, it's such a problem, it's exhausting. And you can find children that will turn out tragically like their mom. What does it mean to say someone is gray? Someone is gray comes out of a lot of our colleges and universities because there are no absolutes. You have your truth. Oh, I have my truth. Whether something's right and wrong depends upon the situation. There's nothing you can say, that is the way it is, that is the way. Oh, no, no, everything has to be gray. Everything has to be negotiable. Everything has to be open. But I've got good news. The stars at night are big and bright. Where? Pitiful, the stars at night are big and bright. Where? Now, what does that mean? <laughs> Why are the stars at night big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas? I dare say there's only a handful of us here know where the heart of Texas is located. Only a handful. It's located in Brady, Texas, 10 miles out to the northeast. That's the very heart and central point in Texas. And Brady is a small town. It is noted for only one thing. Dr. Rudder, who was president of Texas A&M. He's the product of this wide spot in the road, almost in the very heart of Texas. Now, why are the stars at night big and bright in the heart in Brady, Texas? Do you know why? It's because there's no ambient lights. There's nothing competing with the darkness except you look up and the stars at night are big and bright. Decisiveness, clarity. And when something is gray or someone is gray, there is no Decide. Too many competing lights, too many competing agendas, too much noise, too much racket, but when there is clarity. And that's our problem with parenting, ladies and gentlemen. You take any mom and dad and say, here's a baby that you've been given. What is your goal for that child? Well, I want them to be upwardly mobile. I hope they're educated. And I Hope they have more than I have, and I hope just some sort of general type of things. If you've ever been bird hunting and you think you shotgun, you shoot up there without aiming, 
chances are you'll hit nothing. You'll hit nothing. And therefore, parents need to know what their goal is. What are you trying to develop? What would God have you to build into that son, into that daughter? It has to be a clear thing, a clear definition. And that's exactly what we've been talking about, isn't it? We've been saying, train up a child in the way he should go. Review here for most of us. You may have missed it. The way is one way. You can train up our children. I could train up my children in many ways, but there's really one way to train up a child according to the Bible. You can read all the psychologists, all the modern books, but God has one way to do it. We talked about it in training. Train them to love God with all they got, first commandment. Love God with everything, first and foremost. Secondly, train them to love people. Love your neighbor. Try to love that we can't as much as we love ourselves, but that's our goal. The third thing is Bandera. The Bandera principle. Most of you had a little psychology. You don't know who that is. Bandera said the way you best teach people is by example. Is by saying, walk after me. Do as I do. Live as I live. Follow me, follow me. That's the principle, and that's the third thing. Teach our kids to love God with all they've got. Teach our kids how to love people. And you know how they learn to do that? By looking at mom and dad, and we have to say, that's the way I want to live, obeying those first two commandments that Jesus said has priority of all the other rules and regulations. Not going too fast for anybody, am I? God doesn't make it exceedingly complex. It is relatively simple. And therefore, he says, I would do anything in the world for my kids. Model Jesus Christ in your life. Oh, because remember, they do pretty much what we require them to do until they become teenagers and they begin to do and live the way you and I live the way you and I do things, the way you and I think. Train up a child. When we're doing that, we're not gray parents, are we? We are decisive. We see what God's goal is. And then we looked at bring up a child, remember? We looked at Proverbs, train. Then we looked to Ephesians in chapter number six. It says, bring up a child in the discipline Big word. And instruction, oh, of the Lord. And we discovered that discipline primarily takes place between, remember the ages, three to 13. That's when mom and dad really has a role in the eyes and the life of that son or daughter of God. That is when we bring them to submission. That is when we say, this is the way it is. This is how things operate. And therefore, we take over the authority of our children between three and 13. If you don't, oh, oh, that's when you have so many problems with teenagers because they haven't learned that when you say yes, you mean yes, you say no, you say no. And if you don't do that from three to 13, you're in for a long, long, tough ride, mom and dad. It can change, but it's much more difficult. So discipline first, and then after that, there's instruction. This is when we talk with them. This is when we explain. In those years, three to 13, we say, you do this, you don't do this, you stop here, you go there. They say, well, why? Because I said so, that's enough. That's what happens during those years. And then the years from 13 followed get so much easier because they, you've established a sense of authority. Then you can explain. Then you can go in the other details that needs to take place. We've already been through this. Some of you, you missed it. Foundational principles of not being a gray mom and dad. Clarity, distinctiveness, 
understanding the goal right there. And then we're still in Proverbs. I want to show you another little pregnant verse that's in the same chapter that we find train up a child. It's in chapter number 22, verse number 15. I've divided it into two parts. Hope you have your Bibles with you. By the way, in front of you, there's a Bible. Oh, yeah, that's not a hymn book. That's a Bible. The words are on the screen for the hymn. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Get your Bibles. Turn to Proverbs. You go to the book of Psalms and turn right a little bit, and you'll run right into Proverbs. Psalms is in the middle of the book. You can't follow and grow in the church unless you bring your Bible. Okay? If you don't have one, there's one in front of you. Turn to the middle, a little bit to the right. You've got Proverbs, verse chapter number 22, verse number 18. It says, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. That's your challenge. That's my challenge as a parent or a grandparent. Got that? Foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child. And the answer for that is the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Foolishness is bound up in the mind of a child. That's our challenge. Children are fools. Oh boy, oh, oh out of my child is, no, no. Children are fools because they cannot determine that which is best for themselves. They have free will, but they do not have the ability to make those wise choices, do they? No. A child is self-centered. A child is all about me. A child is all about what I want, what I like, what gives me pleasure, what I love to eat. That's children. But children cannot make wise choices for themselves. And as you and I do not make wise choices for ourselves, that in the sense we are still childs. Somebody who makes wise choices for themselves, guess what? They are mature. Not going too fast for anybody, all you balcony folks, y'all got that way up there? We're mature. When we're able to make wise choices for ourselves, that's the process of maturity. And we make silly, foolish, wrong, and er errant choices. We live a life that is basically gray. We keep on making bad choices, but our, in our children there is foolishness. And we can encourage that foolishness. Illustration, here's a five-year-old, says to mama, I want, my, my friends are having a spend the night party over at so-and-so's house, and I want to go. The mother says, no, you cannot go, five years old. Man, that's a temper tantrum, why everybody's going, I'm invited, they're gonna have a good time. But mama knows what will happen at that little five-year-old overnight party. Mama knows the family, the home in which those children will spend the night. And so mama, without any explanation, says no, and there's a temper tantrum. And then mama says, well, maybe I've made a mistake. You know, maybe I acted too hasty. Maybe we need to consider. And then that mother starts to negotiate with the child, a five-year-old, folks. That's the modern word. You have to cooperate with your children. Let me tell you something. If no doesn't work and you have to bribe animals you train by food and by punishment, not humans, not children, it doesn't work that way, ladies and gentlemen. And if that mother begins to negotiate with that child, you mark it down, wait till that child gets to be a teenager. You know, I don't know why my teenager's like this. It's because a father and a mother didn't establish clear, without shouting, absolute authority between three and 13. A child has a foolish heart because they cannot determine with their own understanding, with their background, how to really make wise choices so fathers and mothers have to step in and without argument, without debate, without negotiation, without manipulation, without rewards, this is the way we do it. You do that from three to 13, the teenage years will be a blast. It won't be perfect, but it'll be infinitely easier. Throw a temper tantrum, ho ho. So then 
train up a child the way they should go because a child has a heart that is foolish. Anybody want to debate the foolishness of a child's heart? No, we understand that. What is the answer for that? This will surprise you. It is the latter part of that 15th verse. Look at it. The rod, the rod of discipline will remove it far from him. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. You know the verse, spare the rod, spare the rod, spoil the child. Everybody familiar with that verse, spare the rod, spoil. Everybody familiar with that Bible verse, everybody here? Only one problem that's not in the Bible. Hello. Oh, I thought, no, no, no. Spare the rod, spoil the child is not in the Bible. Look for it. Can't find it. All of us who raise our hand, whoop, it's not there. But what is there? It's the instructions, the latter part of what we do about foolishness in the heart of a child as parents. It says this is what we do. The rod, the rod of discipline will move it far from him. You see, the rod of discipline. Now, the rod there is in the definite article. It is a definite article. What does that mean? It means that the rod, it is a specific procedure by which we engage in as parents to get the foolish out of our children. A rod, not the baseball player. A rod is in the indef is an indefinite article. Rod is used many times in the Bible for many things. It's used for a staff. It's used for what the shepherd has. It's used, and that is a rod. You find it over there in Exodus chapter number twenty-one. A rod can be harmful. It is a harm. It is a rod. It is a stick. It is a bar. It is a limb. It is something that will harm. But the rod. Doesn't mean discipline can't be in there, but the rod says, this is the program, the way God has planned for you to get foolishness out of your child. Do you get the difference? The rod is a definite article every time you see it in the Bible. And it says, this is God's program this is the way God operates. It's the rod. It's the program, the, the agenda. And you can look at, you can also, you can turn in your Bible to the very next chapter over to Psalm Proverbs 23. It says, apply your heart to discipline and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not hold back discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. The rod is not a stick. That is a rod, the rod is God's principles for getting foolishness out of your sons and daughters. Do you get that? It's very important. Well, you say, you don't believe in uh, in, in spanking? Yes. You you don't believe in corporate punishment? Yes, but we'll deal with that next time in more detail and more practicality. But in the meantime, this verse doesn't say every time your child steps out of line, bam, Some people think that. Oh, he did this, bam, slap. No, no, no. It says that we understand God's program for bringing up children, and that is the rod. That is a definite article. A rod is a stick or a board, as you see it in the Bible. Well, how does this operate? It means that sometimes we discipline our children Primarily, the discipline comes, listen to me carefully. These are generalities. Don't, oh, that, you don't be specific, the date, the year, and the month. I'm talking in general generalities from the time the child is three until they are 13, really until they are six. You use uh, maybe a switch. Uh, in, in my back tree, we had a weeping willow tree, and my mother would go out there and get one of those long things, take the leaves off, and pew. And there's a time to do that. Not all the time. And we'll talk about the, the seriousness when we do this, but that's a part of the training. That's a part of restraining them. That's a part of helping them. That's a part of teaching them. When they run out in the street and you say, stop, 
It's a good idea you've trained them to stop. What do you think about that? That's not too wild for anybody, is it? And it takes some restraint there. But primarily, it's in those early times. Then when they get to be sick, somebody says, well, you need to kind of change corporate discipline, and you do. There's other ways, many other ways to distance your as you get older. But when they get to be teenagers, you don't use corporate discipline. I don't necessarily agree with that. I came up, every coach in our school had a paddle. How many of you came up in a school like that, guys? Lift your hand. Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I'm in good company. And I can tell you, on his confession, in junior high, I visited the coach's office quite frequently. <laughs> but not in high school, you know. In high school, it's cultured. In my senior year in high school, our principal got up, Mr. Boyd, we nicknamed him Brat. Mr. Boyd, distinguished man, played minor league baseball. He was lecturing in chapel one day and he stood up, he said, I don't know, some of you boys have been running the hall and I catch anybody running the hall, they're gonna have to answer to me. Well, I was a senior, I didn't run in the halls. But after chapel was over, my buddy, my book's right, he picked up a book and sort of stepped outside and I took out a couple steps after him and ran right into Mr. Boyd. I mean, I almost knocked him down. Oh my, he looked at me, he said, Edwin, follow me to my office. <laughs> now, I wasn't worried about the pain, but I was filled with shame. So I followed him to his office. We got in there, he says, I know you haven't been running in the halls, but I'm going to punish you because and I told him, well, I just stepped out and didn't try to make an excuse. He said, grab your ankles. Now, that's when I could grab my ankles. <laughs> and so I grabbed my ankles, and he had a paddle. I've been paddled by 200-pound coaches, 250-pound coaches, football. But Mr. Boyd was a little guy, but he played baseball. He had a paddle. <laughs> and I bent over, and I had discovered something. Some of you guys never figured out. If you relax, it won't hurt as much. You know, if you hadn't figured that out, you hadn't had much paddling. So Mr. Boyd took and hit three licks, pow, pow, pow. That's the hardest licks I've ever gotten. And I'd been paddled by some mighty big guys. So I turned around. He said, you won't be running the halls anymore with you. And I said, no, sir, I don't think I will. I, I remember it like yesterday, by the way. And I walked out of the office and his assistant was the office next door. And she also knew me. She went to my church. And uh, she said, come in here a minute, Edwin. Yes, ma'am. And she said, I want to tell you something. Mr. Boyd is the principal. He is your pal. And he said, a principal, you spell principal, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L-E, when they are a principal. And said, also, you spell principal, P-R-I-N what? Huh? P-I-L, principal, not pal, P-I-L. And he said, Mr. Boyd sets principles, P-L-E, principal, and he also is a principal, and I've never forgotten the difference. A principal is somebody who runs something like a school, and principals, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-L-E, that are principals, and a principal in that school was, don't run in the hall. I've never forgot that little English twist there. So I don't say there's not a chance or doesn't need some corporate punishment, maybe, but it has to be a gross mistake like running the hall of a school. <laughs> My point, a child's heart is foolish and we have to deal with that foolishness with diligence, with conscientiousness, and knowing that our big goal, what we built in for our children to be and our children to become. And it says we drive it out by what? What do we drive it about by? Right here in the scripture, go back to our scripture, it's very clearly, it says the rod, the rod, remember the rod is the principle of God 
will remove foolishness from that child. Now, let's be practical for a moment. What is the modus operandi of parenting? Unconditional love. That's what works in all of this. That's how we're able to, to discipline, to instruct. It's because they know our parents' modus operandi is love, and we want them to know a couple of things. To know that they are important and to know that they're safe. Know they're important and know that they're safe. And they know that big time, most of all, by discipline. They know their love because we care enough for them to go out of the way. It's easier to bribe a child, to appease a child, to stop the crying. But how do we use this modus operandi, this unconditional love practically in the whole area of getting the foolishness out of our sons and daughters? First of all, we have to Control them with our eyes. We have to control them with our eyes. A baby is born for about, four, about three weeks to five weeks. Their eyes are trying to focus, okay? About five weeks to eight weeks, their eyes just flit around. They're looking anywhere. When they get about eight weeks up, their eyes begin to slow down and they're all looking for something. What is it? They're looking for eyes. They're looking for the eyes of that mother, the eyes of that person. The eye is so important. Parents need to understand. Parents that sort of look at their children, glance at them and look over here and they're talking over here. You instruct, you communicate love or discipline with your eyes. Going back to school, I had an English teacher named Miss Satterfield. Uh, she was something. And the way she disciplined was that when you were doing something wrong, she would say, <laughs> she wouldn't say a word, she'd just look at you. We call it the Satterfield eye. <laughs> and I'm telling you, if it were skinned on you, you straightened up. I've used that for kids years ago. It works. So your eyes. We, we physically contact them with our eyes. It is so important for parents. And in personality, ever talk to somebody, they sort of talk to you like this. I don't mean you just stare them down the bit and look in your eyes. No, you, you, you just comfortably look at people you, with their eyes. Parents, that's the way our children, our babies understand love. Also, there is the physical contact, the eye contact, the physical contact. I want to show you a little, little bit of that, how mother handled a squealing, squealing baby. What happened? There was a physical contact with the mom. That was the physical. It has to go not only from infant, but all the way through those years, there needs to be hugs, there need to be kisses, there need to be touch. Even particularly a teenage girl needs to be a teenager. Her dad needs to hug her in the right way, hug her. In fact, there's a study been done, I don't know how accurate it is, that everybody needs 10 hugs a day. That just helps everything. This has nothing to do with sensuality. By the way, they have large professional huggers all over America now. It is not prostitution. It's not anything sensual. They're just people who go around and they hug people in rest homes after COVID. They were really popular and they just go and hug people and hug people. One lady I read about made over $300,000 a year as a hugger, a professional hugger. <laughs> Why? By our eyes, we communicate, we care, we love. By hugging and affection in the right gen, the right way, we communicate that. We all need about 10 hugs a day. This is what we have. Also, there needs to be not only eye contact, physical contact, there has to be emotional contact. 
Study your baby, study your son, your daughter, and get to know them and understand their heart and somehow bind your heart around their heart. And then you begin really to be a successful parent in the 21st century. It starts way back during pregnancy, certainly when they're born. These are biblical principles that are, are beautiful when we practice them. We see wonderful things coming through the life of your children and my children and my grandchildren. This is how we do it. Tommy Edison was in the second grade. He came home from school one day and Tommy gave his mother a note and said, Mother, uh, this note uh, is from the teacher and she told me to give it to you. And the note read, Dear Mrs. Edison. And as the mother read it to little Tommy, he said, read it to me. And, and with tears in her eyes that she read, Dear Ms. Edison, your son, Tommy, is brilliant. He's a genius. He's far beyond the ability of any teacher in this school to teach him. You're going to have to teach him at home. He's not welcome back here because he is far, far beyond anything we can do. Hmm. So Mrs. Edison taught her son at home. He became Thomas Edison, perhaps one of the most creative minds ever produced, not only in America, but in the world. When his mother died, years later, he was looking through some things in a drawer. And according to his memoir, he saw that little note that he'd carried home to his mother. And he said, you know, I want to read that note myself. And the note didn't say what his mother said that it said. The note said, your son is addled. That meant mentally ill in that day. We won't let him come back to school here anymore. You'll have to teach him. Edison said when he read that, he cried and cried for hours. And then he wrote in his memoir these words, Thomas Alva Edison was an adult child that a hero mother became, became the genius of the century. An adult child because of a hero mother became the genius of the century. Mom and dad, everybody may give up on your son and daughter because they say, oh, they're fools. But a mom and dad who brings a child up, teaching, loving with unconditional love, you'll be amazed at what that son and daughter will become. Uh, I, I bumped into this and paraphrased it this is Dr. Seuss's, almost the last words that he had written down. He was a Christian before he died. And it's a good word for kids and for parents. It goes, you have brains in your head, you have feet in your shoes, you steer yourself any direction you choose, you're on your own and you know what you know and you are the one who decides where to go. All the places you'll go, you're on your way, you're seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers at who soar to the high heights. Oh, the places you'll go, the places you'll go. Don't forget what you know, you'll reap what you sow. The parenthesis of your day begins when you pray. Read a scripture or two, then make up your bed. Now you've fed your heart and you've filled your head. Oh, the places you'll go. You're ready for the day. Whatever comes your way, stand for the truth. Stay away from the G-R-A-Y gray. And before your head hits the pillow each night, close the parenthesis before turning out the light. 
pray, read another verse from the word, and close your eyes knowing you're an eagle, not a mere bird.